Where does the spotlight shine in the parable? On the prodigal son? On the older brother. Who says, look, I've been here all the time. I've kept your laws. I've done everything you've told me to do. Why are you welcoming this person in? This sinner, right? So, so this, this setting here puts our focus in on a certain part of the parable. That doesn't mean there aren't other parts of the parable that, that aren't important or say important things. But the other thing, particularly with Luke's parables, is to remember that Luke also wrote another book, which is called what? Acts. So a lot of times things that Luke includes, and of course these parables here in 15 are only, uh, this parable of the prodigal son is only in Luke, um, just like Good Samaritan is only in Luke, is that Luke is often looking ahead to the book of Acts. He's telling these stories of Jesus to say something also about what happens in the life of the early church. And so if you think about the parable of the prodigal son and the older brother and the Pharisees, and then you go to Acts 15, where you have the Jerusalem Council, and at the very beginning of the Jerusalem Council, uh, it said some Christian Pharisees, which kind of sounds like an oxymoron to us, there were Pharisees who became Messianic believers in Jesus. And they were part of this early Jerusalem Council. And they objected to the acceptance of Gentiles in the church without following the normal Jewish rules, circumcision, food, purity, and so on. Okay. So you can see that Luke is not just kind of randomly putting stuff here together, but uh, he's trying to say something. He's trying to have Jesus' teaching say something also for the benefit of the early church. And you find this all over. It's fascinating in Luke. Like in Luke 10, after the disciples go on their little mission trip, two by two, um, he says, oh yeah, well, you know, you think that's great. You guys are going to pick up snakes. Well, I don't really want to pick up snakes. Um, <laughs> well, what's he looking ahead to? Book of Acts, chapter 28. What happens to Paul? He gets bit by a snake. Now, there are people who misinterpret that story and, and uh, create this whole kind of tradition of snake handlers, um, particularly in the South. Uh, but that would be kind of missing the point here. Paul wasn't looking for snakes. He didn't say, I, you guys have, I know you guys have a bunch of nasty snakes here. You know, if you put a bunch in a box and bring them here, I'll handle them and show you how much faith I have. No, he's just going about his business, right? He's doing the Lord's work. He's serving, and he gets bit by a snake. And, and all Luke is trying to say is, look, um, if God has a, a plan for you, and, uh, and something happens, you're not going to go before he's ready. He's going to take care of you. So there's a good quote there from Kenneth Bailey on your sheet. Uh, in reaction to the fanciful exaggerations, that the allegorical method produced in past centuries, and so last week we looked at the parable of the Good Samaritan and all the details in it that the early um, Christian writers found. Across the 20th century, there was a stream of scholarship that argued for one point per parable, right? So we talked about that, kind of these polarization um, of extremes. Others allowed for several themes in the parable. The purpose was to protect interpretation from adding meanings to the text that could not have occurred to Jesus or his audience. But if a parable is part of a larger worldview, if it is a house in which we are invited to take up residence, then the dweller in that house can look out on the world from different windows. The house has a variety of rooms. If the great parable of the prodigal son has only one point, which shall we choose? Should the interpreter choose the nature of the fatherhood of God, an understanding of sin, self-righteousness that rejects others, the nature of true repentance, joy in community, or finding the lost? All of these theological themes are undeniably present in the story and together form a whole that I have called the theological cluster. Each part of that cluster is in creative relationship to the other parts. The meaning of each can only be understood fully within the cluster form. 
And, and this is one of the problems sometimes with, with having systems of interpretation is that systems, systems of interpretation limit the word. If you come from a certain kind of theological background, if you have a certain view of premillennialism, amillennialism, postmillennialism, dispensational premillennialism, that becomes a box in which you're trying to fit your scriptures. Right? And, uh, and it's best to just kind of sometimes ignore those things and to look, what's the context? What's this saying? Uh, might it be breaking out of that stricture, that box of interpretation? So anyway, we're moving on. We're in John 15. Uh, last week we looked at the first part of the parable of the vine, the story of the vine. And I got started on that C section on your sheet there, and so I'm going to kind of quickly work through the first part, which I'm going to do. Um, uh, I should read again, uh, 15, 1 through um, probably 6 for now. I'm the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. He cuts off every branch in me that bears the fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Let me stop there for now. Um, so, Jesus is the true vine, and as I mentioned, this is the last of seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. And uh, John's I am statements are kind of like his version of the, the Kingdom of God teaching in the Synoptic Gospels. And if you go to the Synoptic Gospels, the whole central theme of the Synoptic Gospels and, and the teaching of Jesus is the rule of God, the rightful rule of God over his whole and uh, John substitutes that with a different way of looking at things. And, uh, and Jesus is the true vine. And, and that theme of true, or in this case, it's almost like faithful. He's the faithful vine. Because who was the unfaithful vine? Israel, right? Last week we went over all these passages that, that a lot of these stories are based on. Cursing of the fig tree in Mark 11. Uh, this story here, there's all these passages that talk about Israel as a fig tree or a vine, uh, olive tree. And, and these are important background passages which would be swirling around in the heads of, of John's early readers who are, uh, in the case of the Gospel of John, mostly Jewish Christians. So, um, so Jesus is fulfilling Israel's vocation. He is faithfully living the Old Testament story as it should have been lived by the nation of Israel. Um, this is why he picks 12 disciples. Um, they are representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Not literally in that sense, because we have two pairs of, of twins. Um, and so some of those will be from the same tribe, obviously, right? But he is saying, look, this is a renewal movement to my people of Israel. And then, we have the second section there. The father is the vine dresser. He's pruning the dead wood. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute. And then there's the refining of the fruitful vine. It's kind of like this idea of training uh, or, or purifying. Um, there's a good quote from... I didn't bring it. Yeah, there is a good quote, but it's not here. <laughs> From N.T. Wright. Um, where he talks about the idea of the father as a vine dresser to get, uh, to prune the vine, he has to be the closest one to it, right? He has to come near to the vine and, and take the vine in his hand and, and to personally trim it and adjust it. And, and, and it talks about this idea of God being so near so close during this sometimes painful 
process of pruning. Um, so every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Then we talked about Jesus' word as the agent of cleansing. So this is, um, there's, there's vocabulary here in the Gospel of John that kind of gets repeated quite a bit. And he, Jesus says, you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Um, and, and it's really important when you're studying, particularly the Gospel of John, is because there is so much repetition, as we'll see. Um, you should always have a concordance in it. You should be looking up some of these theme words that repeat over and over and over again. Because if it isn't clear in one passage, uh, then you just start looking at another passage. And, and we talked about this, this idea of circles of context, right? So we're in John 15. Um, and then you're going to be reading around. You're going to look at John 14, John 13, John 17, right? Uh, and, and with a concordance, you can kind of see where else does he use these terms? And then the circles of context work out uh, after the Gospel of John, where would you go? To look for something. First, second, third, John. To what? First, second, third, John. There we go. You go to the letters of John. And particularly in the topics that we're looking at in this section of the Upper Room Discourse, there, there are so many parallels in First John that unpack what we're looking at, that clarify what, what Jesus is teaching. So, I mean, just the word abide uh, is used so many times in, 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 in the letters of John um, that they impact how we view and interpret this passage. Okay? So, um, so it's really important to, to you know, do your homework. Look, look at the context. Look at the, the surrounding context of something. Ignore the chapter division. <coughs> Ignore the verse divisions. They weren't there originally. Ignore the little headings that the NIV or the RS, NRSD puts there. Sometimes it throws you off. Ignore the context. Um, and so one of the ways in which Jesus talks about uh, cleansing or purifying the branches is the idea of his word. And there's a quote from John 6 on your sheet there, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and their life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe who would betray him. So this idea of clean, which is a little ambiguous in, in chapter 15, um, if you went earlier to chapter 13 in the foot washing story, you'd see that this this idea is brought up again. Judas is a contrasting example. You are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. And this is this word clean is kafaros in the Greek. And it's the idea of purification, but it also has, it's also the, the word that John uses for pruning. Okay? So it's cleaning, pruning, preparing, refining. Uh, number three, Jesus' disciples of the branch as the branches. I am the vine, you are the branches. And so he talks a lot in this section. I mean, ten times in this section we have this word, which I, I mentioned last week, uh, meno, uh, not meno. And it's the word for remain. Forty times in the Gospel of John, 27 times in the letters of John, uh, ten times in the section we're looking at. So obviously, if you're trying to figure out what he's saying here, you want to know what that means, right? Abiding, or some of your translations have remaining. Um, so Jesus says, abide in me, and I will abide in you. Okay? So in the previous chapter 14, um, the first week of the got we started here, I talked about the paraclete, the ministry of the paraclete. And so there's that theme of this Holy Spirit is the way in which Jesus abides in us. And if we weren't sure about that from the context of the gospel, you just have to turn to 1 John, right? 3.24. By this we know that he abides in us by what? By the Spirit 
So it's not some kind of magical thing. It's, it's, the, it's the Spirit of God abiding and remaining in us. And as we talked about, the, the Holy Spirit is the spiritual replacement for the physical presence of Jesus. No connection to the root. No fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So there's this kind of corporate emphasis here. So here's a vine. Here are these branches. Um, he, he's not saying this is something you can do on your own here, as like, I'm a branch by myself. Um, is that, no, you're connected to other branches on this vine, right? It's a communal idea here. There's no understanding here of Lone Ranger Christians. Uh, and so one way we remain in the vine is by thinking about one another. I mean, this is kind of John's version of Paul's one another's, right? Love one another, bear with one another, burdens, forgive one another. I mean, there are 10 or 12 of those one another's. And there are things that you have to do in community. There are things you do with other Christians. And so this is a very important emphasis, uh, is the idea of connection to the vine. But it's not just connection to the vine with Jesus. It's connection to the vine and the branches that are all connected to Jesus. Um, examples in John. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If you heard... If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you abide in the Son and the Father. Now, there are also the negative examples. What, is it, what does it mean here to not abide in the vine? And we already had an example earlier from the Gospel of John. Um, in the uh, feeding of the 5,000 story in the Bread of Life discourse, um, when Jesus interprets that at the end, of the Bread of Life discourse, it, it's very difficult for his Jewish readers to, to take that in. And so John says, from that time, many of his disciples turned back, no longer followed him. And we don't have anything like that in the other Gospels. So they left the vine. They no longer remained. They no longer abided in Jesus. Uh, in 1 John, we have another example. Because 1 John is written to a church that's had a big split. We're all familiar with church splits. How many of you have ever been part of a church split? Sometimes it's over like the color of the carpet or something like that. Um, but this was much more theological. Uh, John's community split over who Jesus was, over Christology. Uh, did Jesus really come in the flesh? That was a whole big issue. Was he really fully human? And, and so the church has a split where a group of people say, no, I don't believe that. And they went out from that church. And this is what John is writing about. They went out from us. But they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. Same word. No. They would have remained with us. And notice it's corporate here. It's, it's the church altogether. Okay, so moving on. Uh, this is kind of new stuff that we didn't address last week. Um, sometimes it's People divide this section up in different ways, but uh, it's quite clear from the repetition in this passage. And so when you go ahead and put up that chart, um, that the next section, which I'll, I'll go ahead and read from verse 7 on. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be your disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in 
My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last, then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. So you can, can see when you kind of parallel the first section that we looked at, uh, particularly verses 1 through 6, and then this next section. Uh, sometimes it seems like a digression um, and kind of bulls you because John keeps repeating these words over and over again. But uh, there's, there's a lot of um, parallels between the two sections. Uh, I'm a true vine. Oh, I'm going to repeat that in verse 5. Remain in me, those who remain in me. No branch can bear fruit by itself. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Uh, ask whatever you will. Verse 7. The Father will give you whatever you ask. Verse 16. Uh, if my words remain in you, if you obey my commandments, if you do what I command, I mean, Jesus is like, we got it the first time, Jesus. Um, I'm repeating all this. Um, go and bear much fruit. Go and bear much fruit. Okay. Um, you've become my disciples. I chose and appointed you. Anyway, you kind of get the idea there. Um, and so this is important when you're doing Bible studies. Just kind of notice patterns. Notice repetition. Um, so what are the conditions? So Jesus has promised a provision to the disciples. If you remain in me, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. Now, if you get your concordance, you look through the Gospel of John, especially this whole section here, uh, 13 through 17. This is repeated like four or five times. And, and it, it's very, it's stated very generically, and it can be a little bit confusing. Um, Whatever I wish? Are you, are you, are you serious? <laughs> what are the conditions for the provision? One, sustain connection to the vine. So if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you can ask whatever you wish. Right? So there's a condition. B, successful development of fruit. I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask. So very much fruit is connected in this wider context here to the disciples continuing Jesus' mission after he leaves. Right? The, the whole thing here has been introduced with the idea of Jesus in 14 going, hey, you know, I'm the way to God. No one gets the Father except through me. And guess what? I'm leaving. See you. Not taking you with me. <laughs> and they're all upset. Uh, but the whole point is to prepare them as disciples, as apostles, yeah. to, to continue what Jesus is doing. And he even says earlier, he says, look, you know, I did some great things, but what are you going to do? You're going to do even greater things. Well, how's that happen? Jesus is near. Well, it happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the disciples are called here to represent Jesus to the world. Uh, on the back end, connecting prayer to divine purposes. So at the end of our section, uh, there's another kind of condition added to this prayer. The Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Okay, so we often do this, right, in prayer. We're very faithful in this. When we pray at the end, we say, well, in the name of Jesus, we got it. What does that mean? In the name of Jesus. I mean, is God not going to answer a prayer if you don't have that little phrase? <laughs> well, that would be kind of missing the point. Right? Um, because the idea of, of the name is the idea of being a representative, right? Like if you go visit someone and you say, I'm here in the name of, 
this person, then there has to be some congruence, right? Between what you're saying or asking and what the person you're representing is reflecting. And that's kind of the main point here, is that the context here has a lot to do with staying connected to the mind, to abiding in Jesus, to following his commands, to loving one another. And there's some very kind of specific things here, but they're, they're all interrelated. And, and so this is not a blanket promise here that, look, you can pray any little prayer you want and God will go, yep, yeah, you know. It's, it's not like a pop machine. Put my quarter in, stuff comes out, right? There's a great quote there. C.S. Lewis has a little essay on the efficacy of prayer. And I put the quote on the sheet there. There are no doubt passages in the New Testament, you could have put like John 15, um, which may seem at first sight to promise an invariable granting of our prayers. But that cannot be what they really mean. For in the very heart of the story, we meet a glaring instance to the contrary. In Gethsemane, the holiest of all petitioners prayed three times that a certain cup might pass from him. It did not. After that, the idea that prayer is recommended to us as a sort of infallible gimmick may be dismissed. Finally, uh, Jesus' emphasis on obedience. So he says in 1514, you are my friends if you do what I command. Okay, so here he uses the word philos. Um, kind of has the idea of beloved, uh, friendship, beloved. And as I've mentioned before in this class, John Inner changes the words agape and philos. A lot of people think there's a big difference between them, and sometimes in the context there is, but not in the Gospel of John. So you can use them as synonyms. Um, and also in this passage, he says, you're friends, and you're no longer what? Servants. Or actually, probably a better translation here is it's a little stronger, because the word can mean slave. Right? You're no longer slaves. And this is, I find this a little bit ironic. Because it says you're friends, but you're only friends if you what? If you do what I command. Wait a minute, isn't that what a slave does? Slave obeys commands? Well, except that we're talking about the upside down kingdom of God. What kind of leader is Jesus? He's a servant leader, right? And that was already illustrated graphically in chapter 13, where he washed the disciples' feet. And so it's a very different type of master, slave, or servant relationship. And, and masters don't normally tell their slaves everything they're thinking about something, right? They don't even often give them a reason for why you should do something. Just go do it. But Jesus says, no, you're my friends. And I'm going to explain, this is what he's been doing the whole gospel, explaining what his commands are, explaining what his words are, explaining who he is in relation to the Father. So there's this divine chain of command throughout the gospel. The Father, divine master in our passage, the Son, the vine, the disciples, the branches. Um, Jesus says, I have received this command from my Father. I have not spoken on my own, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a command, I don't know what to say. What I speak, therefore, I speak just as the Father has told me. I do as the Father has commanded me. So there's this, this, this understanding of this chain of command, this, this pattern, is that the Father directs the Son, and the Son then directs the disciples. And what Jesus commands, the disciples, they should follow just like Jesus followed what God commanded him. So he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. 
Those who love me will keep my word. Have you noticed the repetition? I mean, I could have put more examples here. Um, commandments, word, teaching, these are all synonyms in the Gospel of John. Okay. So what's the relationship of the law and grace in John? As good Protestants, we often emphasize the idea of grace versus law. Which, which sometimes is really a misunderstanding of passages or a misunderstanding of Judaism. People think Judaism was a religion of works religion. And you read oh, tons of evangelical commentaries nowadays will tell you that's a misunderstanding of what Judaism is uh, and what Israelite relationship and covenant with God is. And it's always been the same in the Old Testament. It's relationship before rules. It's election before ethics. It's covenant before commandments. Okay? This is why Exodus 19 comes before Exodus 20. I just had students do a, uh, an assignment on the book of the covenant, Exodus 20 through 23. A whole bunch of laws. Starts with the Ten Commandments, right? And then it goes into all these, what we call case laws. If you do this, then you should do this. You know, and, 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 and they seem kind of picky uni, but. You know, the law wasn't like the whole shebang for Israel. It wasn't just about religion. It was about uh, all of life. Or even OSHA laws. It's like build a parapet around your second floor so people don't fall off. Um, you know, God's concerned about every little part of life. But before he gives those commandments in chapter 19, he says, well, do you guys want to have a relationship? Israel? Do you, do you want to follow me? Uh, we will do everything you say. <laughs> okay, here are the commandments, right? Covenant, then commandments. It's the same thing in, in Deuteronomy 6, the Shema passage. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. It's first, put these commandments where? On your heart. Then you can put them on your doors. Not someone else's doors. I, I don't get why people try to force the Ten Commandments on our culture. We've got to have these Ten Commandments posted here. That's backwards of Scripture. It's hard first. And there's really not much motivation for people to keep those things if it's not in their heart. We love because he first loved us. He first loved us right? It's grace that leads to gratefulness. That's the motivation. So this is not a new development from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Uh, Paul in Romans 1 says, look, it's from faith to faith. Didn't start out with works and then move to faith. Abraham was what? He believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So there's a good quote here about kind of Paul's view of this as well from Christopher Wright. Paul's aim was nothing short of ethical transformation among those who received that message and responded to it by faith. His shorthand for this comes in the striking phrase with which he begins and ends his letter to the Romans. The obedience of faith for the sake of Christ's name among the nations. The obedience of faith, it is a remarkable single genitive expression, faith's obedience, which unfortunately many translations split apart into two distinct verbs, to believe and obey, which allows the possibility that one might adequately do the first while failing to do the second. Paul's point is much more radical. It is the obedience that proves the reality of the faith. Compare it with an expression like the breath of life. How do you know there is any life in someone? Check if they're breathing. No breath, no life. No obedience, no faith. Feel the breath and rejoice that they're alive. See the obedience and rejoice that they're believers. So, then the nature of Jesus' commands. We're kind of getting to the, the, the nitty-gritty here. What are his commands? He keeps saying, you know, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. Okay, 
Well, those commandments, Jesus. I give you a new command that you love one another. Right? So what John is doing here in chapter 15, or what Jesus is doing here in chapter 15, is elaborating on what he had already said in chapter 13. I'm giving you a new command. Now, why does he call this a new command? They already have love commandments, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. What do you mean, Jesus? How's this new? Well, it's new because now I'm, I'm not just talking about loving your neighbor generally. I'm talking about loving one another. I'm talking about people within your community of faith. Right? Paul puts it this way. Do good to all men, but especially to who? To the household of believers. This is something John's going to unpack a lot more, or Jesus will, in, in chapter 17, where he's going to talk about the importance of unity within the body of Christ. And so, Jesus' love is the model. So what John says, just as I have loved you, disciples, you also should love one another. Okay? Sometimes we, we think of the word love as this is a kind of abstract thing. But they could point and see how Jesus had very practically loved them throughout his ministry. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Whoever says I abide in him ought to walk as he walked. Okay? All connected. So, how did he love them? The sacrificial nature of uh, in our passage, Jesus says, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Okay, he just got through calling them his friends. Now, to understand kind of the, the main background to that, we go to 1 John. We know love by this, that he did what? He laid down his life for us, right? That's the ultimate example. So then, ergo, we ought to lay down our lives for one another, right? Father, Son, disciples. So there's this kind of theology of imitation here that's very important. Um, discipleship means imitating Christ, as Christ is imitating and expressing who God is. The communal nature of Christian love. So here we can go to 1 John. And we can see how John is thinking about this in very specific, practical ways. And when we went over John 13, I have this whole list from 1 John about, you know, his idea of love. I mean, he uses the word love so many times in 1 John. It's like, hey, dude. Um, he's like the apostle of the um, <laughs> If anyone has material possessions, and sees his brother or sister in need and has no compassion towards him. How can the love of God be in them? Now, this is where the literal translation here in the Greek, I think, is so much better. Um, if anyone has material possession, sees his brother or sister in need, and shuts his bowels, that's what it says in the Greek, shuts his entrails. Well, this word that's used slanking on, um, I'm a weird word, but it, it, it refers to the entrails. It refers to your gut, right? Like we sometimes use it in that kind of metaphorical sense. We say, I had a gut feeling, right? If you're really overwhelmed by a certain situation, doesn't it affect you here? You start to feel things here. And, and, and this, is the, this is this idea, and, and, and they start to translate it as the idea of compassion. Not just that you're feeling this, but that you actually are then acting on it. You're doing something about it. And, and of course, Jesus is the greatest example of this. Um, so tell me you can put up a little bit. So John's, John's terminology 
mentioned here an example. Of course, it's, it's going back to Jesus. Uh, Jesus in a letter. Moved with compassion. Okay, it's the same word, splank non. Moved with this gut feeling. When he saw this leper, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. <clears throat> Jesus in the crowd. I have compassion, splank non, for the crowd. Because they've been with me now for three days. I've had nothing to eat. Jesus and the widow's son. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. The Good Samaritan, when he saw him, he was, when he saw this guy on the side of the road, who, you know, everyone else is passing by, it says he was filled with compassion. He had to do something. The Apostle Paul uses the word, For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Jesus Christ. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Clothe yourselves with this gut feeling of pity, of empathy with people. And of course, again, this is nothing new. We have this as an expression from the Old Testament. The Lord, the Lord, a God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Jesus is expressing who God is. We are to express who God is through Jesus to other people. And this is why I get so bugged sometimes at, at cynicism within the Christian community or within Christians. And I, I find myself thinking this way too. Like I'm going to Costco and I get off the off ramp and there's this guy with a little sign there and he wants money and I'm going, I'm tempted. So why don't you get a job? And who knows why this person is in the position they are. Uh, what this is teaching us is that instead of an attitude like that and questioning what, what people are going through, why they're in this situation, why they're poor, it, it's that we see examples of compassion. I get so bugged when people misinterpret John 12, where uh, you know, the woman washes Jesus' feet and spends all this money. And the disciples get kind of bugged and goes, hey, you're wasting all this, you know, good oil and perfume. And, and Jesus says, well, well you'll, you'll always have the poor with you. And people have misinterpreted that phrase in a very cynical way. I've had people tell me this. They say, yeah, well, you know, you'll always have, Jesus said you'll always have the poor, so no point in doing anything. Well, if you look at the context and you look at the connection to Deuteronomy 15, it's there very clearly. Jesus is saying, you always have the poor to serve. You'll always be the poor to serve, to take care of. And, and this is the thing that, that the early leaders of the, of the Jerusalem church asked Paul, like if you go to Galatians 2.10, right? They're not all on the same page, right? They're not necessarily on the same platform religiously. And, and, and James and Peter and John, they say, okay, Paul, well, you know, we don't completely agree with the way you're going about this gospel message. I mean, it's kind of upset a lot of people. And, uh, and, and and, and Paul's splitting from people like Barnabas, his close helper. And so what did James, Peter, and John say? Okay, Paul, all we ask is this. Single issue voter. All we ask is this. Remember the what? E? Remember the poor. That's all we ask, Paul. Remember the poor. Paul says, I was happy to do that. Because it's consonant with God's compassion. Right? It's consonant with God as a defender of the weak, as a defender of the poor. And so you can read in the book of Acts that when there's a famine in Jerusalem, what does Paul do? 
takes up a collection in Antioch and travels down to Jerusalem. You can read in almost all of Paul's letters where he talks about the collection, right? So this is something where he gets his Gentile churches to say, look, the, 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 the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, they're being ostracized by their fellow Jews. They're being, people aren't buying from them. They're financially struggling. And, uh, and you Jews, you have benefited from the gospel that came from them, right? I mean, Jesus in John 4 to the woman, he says, well, salvation is from the, from the Jews. Starts there. And so you Gentiles better pony up. You better start providing for these poor brothers and sisters in Jerusalem who are struggling. And, uh, you know, we see it in the book of Acts, in Acts 2 and 4, that the early believers did not consider anything they owned to be their own. They held everything in what? Common. Well, that's a duh thing, right? In the Old Testament, God says what? All this stuff is, is mine. You're just a steward. It's not your stuff. Every single thing we see around us is created from the raw materials that the Creator established in Genesis 1 and 2. Every single little thing we create is from those raw materials. God says, yeah, okay. Build it. Discover it. Do something with it. But use it in a wise way. And use it for the benefit of the kingdom. Sorry, I'm getting I'm starting to preach here. <laughs> uh, oh, now I gotta go get music. Alright, so uh, you can read the rest of the, the outline there. Um, let's, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you that it uh, sometimes pierces us, Lord. It makes us uncomfortable. Uh, it calls us to do things that uh, we're not sure we want to do. And uh, it makes us change our worldviews sometimes. We thank you for your word, Jesus. Thank mm -hmm. you.